If you want to talk about how maybe you can take what you're doing up to another level on social media, uh, Dave Kirpin's joining us. And he's written a couple books, by the way. Um, this one is last, uh, I guess, is the a re, a, is it this is this copy brought back? Yes, yeah, the third edition of the, my first book. If you do a third edition, it's probably something you may want to think about, likable social media. But he says that this is probably one of his more popular books, The Art of People. We'll get into it. Um, well, first of all, why bring this book back? And uh, welcome, to, welcome. Well, Thank you. Great, great to be Good here. To I'm, see a, you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan, so it was always ex it was exciting when you reached out and said, uh, "Let's do an interview." Because uh, obviously, I'm a big, big baseball fan and been following uh, you and Steiner for a while. So it's uh, exciting to be here, even if unfortunately uh, most of the memorabilia on the walls uh, is for for the uh, the wrong team. It's not true. We, we we just follow the teams that help us make money and, and the teams that win, and some teams just don't win, but. We like the Mets when they win, and I like a lot of teams they, when they win. When they I, win, I feel good about them this year. I yeah. think they're going to win some games. I mean, you know, your fan base does not show up when your team doesn't win. That's my problem. Like real fans show up when their teams win. Do you show up when your f team wins? Because I cannot believe how empty City Field is when the team starts doing. Poorly. I've been showing up. Uh, this will be my thirty-third consecutive opening day. Wow! And uh, I, I, I personally show up because uh, I, I do believe you got to support. Uh, you got to support the the team. We'll get back to the Mets. Sure. Because I know you're a diehard Mets fan, but why this book? Well, what's so special about this? Because this gets my attention because we're all trying to get more likes. Yeah. But why this book? Yeah, so so this was my first book, and um, uh, I was very fortunate. We were one of the first social media agencies on the planet uh, back in 2007, and uh, McGraw-Hill reached out to me uh, a couple years later and said, we'd like you to write write a book about all the cool stuff that you're doing. And so... Uh, we wrote the book. Um, I'm very, very fortunate. It's done. It's done very well. Uh, 14 languages. It's been translated to now. So how many books? Well have been, how many world. copies of this book have we sold? Sold have a couple you, hundred thousand copies. I mean, that, is, uh, that's like you know, as an author, that that's uh, it's, big hard, time. it's hard to sell. Anytime books. you get to a hundred thousand, like my books haven't cracked a hundred thousand. But even if you get past ten thousand, is a big thing. The the average so this book is a, this is a real this is a real for, thing for any for any wannabe authors out there. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you some very harrowing news. The average Say book it. sells 150 copies. 150, not 150,000, not 1,500, 150. I mean, you'd have to be crazy to be in, to to want to make money to try to make money as an author. It's it's insanity. And so much content out there. You got to know what you're doing. But but that, but, but, but fortunately, this, this is a nerve. Well, so so yeah, so 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 it did very well. And one of the good things and bad things, I guess, about writing a book about social media is it becomes. Uh, obsolete fairly quickly so that that's why we did a second and now third edition i mean i originally wrote it in 2011 who's this eight book years for? later who is it like why should i buy this book who, who's this book for? how's this gonna help uh, me i would say it's for 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 marketers for entrepreneurs uh small business owners those are really the three categories and what's, of folks. what's what's this book gonna do for me um i think it's helpful in in getting it it's, it's helpful especially for folks that didn't grow up with social media right so so there's still a couple serious generations out there of, of folks that didn't actually grow up using social media platforms. Like my kids don't need to read this because they've been using Instagram since they were, you know, seven years it's old. Natural. So this could be the ABCs for people that may have missed. For missed anyone it. that's of a slightly older generation, what I would say is it's really helpful because, you know, the way that communications the way that communications is has completely changed. The social media represents this huge paradigm shift between one-sided communications of old and now two-sided communications. I mean, we're live right now. I can share this with my audience as we're speaking, and we can get feedback instantly. Imagine, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that just wasn't possible. That 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 sort of two-way communication didn't exist. And so th that, that's, that's one of the just amazing things about... Uh, the world that we live in right now. Hold on, I gotta. I'm gonna share this live. This could create some feedback. Let's try to do it quickly. If you had a question for Dave about your social media, something you want to see happen, or you're frustrated because certain things aren't happening, we'll do some Q and A in a little while. Just plug right underneath there. By the way, tell me where you're from. You know, we always like to hear, especially if you're outside the country, outside New York. If you're a Met fan, tell me why you're optimistic. We can get into that at some point. I mean, if you are a Mets fan, if you are optimistic, oh, there are a lot of Mets fans out there. And optimistic, there are a lot of Mets fans. There are a lot of Mets fans out there, Brandon. There really are. You we are know, also yeah. from Brooklyn. Well, I, you know, I'm I love guy. our I'm fellow entrepreneur yeah. from Brooklyn. And by the way, I've started Steiner with the Mets. People don't realize that. I did not realize. Yeah, that. I mean, I was all over. So the Mets were your first contract? No. 
Well, actually, they weren't my first contract, but the players on the Mets, back to Keith, Straw, Darling, yes. all those guys, Lenny Dykstra, Gooding, Carter, were all my first guys that really gave me my first shot. Yeah. Those you know guys I mean? were, and, and I, you know, yeah. 86 was my first year following baseball. I was 10 years old, yeah. and I fell madly in love with uh, basically all those guys. That you really just started said. like in 85 and yeah. 84, really. Yeah. With sure. the, well, you know, Keith, good in 84, yeah, good in, you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? And then even 88, people don't realize how, close, team the, in 88. how close the Mets really were and probably should have won a World Series that year if they didn't have that quirky, stupid playoff series with the Dodgers. The Dodgers went on to win. Uh, but it was that was, their, that was their team. that They had the best team. There's no question. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad you realized that. But, but yes, there, there have been some lean years. Happen, not there. much is happening. Uh, well, well you know, we, we, we gave it a shot in 2000. We and, we we, and we gave it a shot. Against, you know, they were close against the uh, 2006 Kansas City. 2007. Yeah. Two, yes, Kansas City. That was. I was there, of course, for the uh, like like the rest of the stadium. I wanted Harvey to stay in the game, and uh, you unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, he did uh, stay in the game. Yeah. Well, I'd be, I'd be curious to see how his career goes. You know, he's <laughs> he's an interesting character, and a lot of people don't make it in New York for a lot of reasons. Not just because they're most people think, well, he could, he could pitch on the stage, but you can't let the other outside extractions. You know, there's so many distractions. Yeah. In New York, you can get caught up into. I, I feel like Ron Dalling never was the pitcher he could have been because of all the distractions and the people and the socialite. But and, and let me ask you one thing: you talked about creating some movements, which is like that's a big statement. Like you know, it's one thing to go create something, you get a lot of views and likes. Yeah. You said you can create a lot of excitement around a situation. Tell me a couple examples on how do you do that? Yeah, sure. So you know, if 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 you like me. I'm a media magnet, and if you don't like me, I'm a media whore. But fortunately, in my career, I've been very, very blessed to be able to um, help attract attention and 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 build build a movement around things. My first experience was with this was um, when I was in college. I, I actually also sports related. I went to school in Boston, um, and I I, li I went to school at BU. I lived just a couple blocks from Fenway Park, so I took a job working as a ballpark vendor um, at Fenway Park and uh, and soon thereafter the Boston Garden. And I don't know how much you know about the ballpark vending business, Brandon. I know enough, but yeah. I'll elaborate, I'm sure everybody well, would be well, interested. Well, essentially, it's a, it's a seniority-based system. So you you, you got to work for a couple of years to get the beer and the hot dog. So you start off on the lowest selling products. Which and was? And it's also which was? pure commission and tips. Uh, so you only get paid based on what you sell plus tips. So my first day on the job, I had the worst pr performing uh, product in the building. It's called Crunch and Munch. Um, funny side note, the it's buttery toffee popcorn with peanuts category. Um, you have to have a ridiculous name. So the four major competitors in the category are Crunch, Cracker Jack, of course, Crunch and Munch, Fiddle Faddle, and Poppycock. Why? I have no idea. But such is life. So my first day on the job, I sold eight boxes. I got paid the legal minimum of $15. Came back the second day, determined to um, sell more, more Crunch and Munch. And, um, and I had to get people's attention to do it. Um, and I don't have any talents, but uh, I nonetheless sang and danced and juggled some boxes in order to sell Crunch and Munch. And like I said, absolutely talentless. But the only one thing that I did have was uh, creativity and I guess fearlessness, right? Just putting myself out there. And before long, uh, the Boston Herald wrote about it and uh, I was on ESPN. And you know, before long, I was selling a lot, a lot of Crunch and Munch. How much? Uh, at my peak, I was selling a few hundred boxes a game and making about $1,000 a game. So for a college kid, that's pretty good. Um, and I fell in love with sales and marketing uh, after that experience. Um, I kind of maxed out what you could do as a ballpark vendor, so did you, eventually did you I had to get a real job. Did you have an aha moment that you realized you weren't normal? <laughs> I did. In a good way. I did, I did. And actually, the, I, 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 I did very few smart things, but the one aha moment and the, the smart thing that I did when I was the Crunch Munch guy is the, the, the uh, first or second newspaper article I was in, uh, in the Boston Herald, the next day, somebody asked me to autograph a box of Crunch Munch. So I was like, okay, that's cool. But then the one smart thing I did, Brandon, was I asked that person if I could borrow their Sharpie. And I proceeded to sign every box of Crunch and Munch I sold that night unsolicited. And what I was able to do in the course of just one night was create the perception in the building that not only did you need to get a box of Crunch and Munch from the Crunch and Munch guy, but you need to get it signed. And that really took up the sort of uh, Crunch and Munch guy uh, shtick to another level and and it allowed me to just really kind of cement myself as the the uh, the go-to guy uh, that's what i'm talking about man yeah. now we're speaking I, I think we were meant to talk about this but 
Did you end up even going? Is that what took you to the thousand boxes? That was, that, that's what took me to the thousand. Yeah, people were going before. crazy. Yeah, yeah. It, and, the kids and, were going crazy. Kids were going crazy. Not, not everyone liked it. In fact, to this day, I have some haters out there, some serious, uh, I won't necessarily mention them, but let's just say some serious sports reporters from the Boston area. Uh, the one person I will mention, because it's all, it was uh, back in the news back then, Rick Pitino uh, was coaching the Celtics back then. And there was a time, he had a timeout, and his players were watching me do my shtick instead of paying attention to him. Patino had a fit and uh, I ended up getting suspended. But of course, you can't suspend somebody for doing their job. So I ended up getting my job back. But Patino asked for, for me to be out of there. Uh, I ended up, the, the end of that story is I ended up outlasting Patino in Boston by a couple of years. But, um, you know, I had some haters. But one of the things I've learned, Brandon, is, you know, if you're going to if you're going to take a chance and build something and get people's attention, not everyone's going to like it. And and you are going to there are going to always be people when you put yourself out there that don't like what you're doing. That's OK. I mean, you know, so that was like a beginning point of realizing you got to differentiate yourself, create maybe value. Uh, be a little different, be a little be, different, be unique, and, and stand out, and right, and offer something that people, you know, wouldn't ordinarily uh, see, uh, especially for the media, right? So, so the me media loves a great story, and when you can provide them with that great story, um, you can have the media helping to tell your story instead of, and instead of thinking about it like you're pitching the media, you need more attention. Think about it like, what's the story that you can tell that the media that everyone is going to want to share? Right. And tell me about the uh, – now, the, obviously, that's the, kind of the nucleus of you realizing how to put the two and two together. I feel for you because I, I agree with you 100%. I think if you can create a story that's compelling and that's interesting, you know, to people, you just let it take its course. Right. And it always works out. But tell me about some of the movements. Tell me some of the things you've done online that people can relate to because we have a lot of people that watch that struggle to get the word out. I see a lot of charities that are doing such good work struggle to get the word out. And unless you really know how to do that on social media, I mean, it's hard to really go through normal or traditional old school ways of marketing. It's right. more complicated now than ever. Right. Well, it's about creating great content um, and being really consistent with it, right? So one of the real early things on uh, that we did in our agency was, you know, it was just a few of us. And um, I said to my wife, my business partner, I said, let's, let's start a blog. And she said, okay, great. And I said, well, we'll call it Buzz Marketing Daily. And she said, well, Buzz Marketing Daily, if we call it Buzz Marketing Daily, we gotta write something every day. And I said, exactly. And we forced ourselves to write something every single day, and lo and behold, within several months, it was one of the top trafficked blogs in, uh, blogs in the world. Still do it? Uh, we still blog, we don't blog every day now, um, because actually the things have changed a little bit, and it's actually more important now to have really great content, and you can have less of it. And then, unfortunately, for better or for worse, as you can see in the third edition versus the, the earlier editions, you have to kind of pay to get the word out there. So one of the one of the real, for me, downsides of uh, the changes in social media over the last uh, few years is that it used to be that great content alone could generate eyeballs. And now it's a pay to play no matter what. Now, not, you know, you got a 1% chance if you don't pay. But it's much, much easier if you if, if you pay. And the good news is you can still get away with paying less to reach the right people. So one of the amazing things about Facebook and LinkedIn is you can still target super, super precisely to reach the people that you want to reach. One of the stories I like to tell is um, I was talking about the, the amazing targeting criteria with some friends at a conference in, uh, in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. And we were talking about the precision with which you can target and I thought, wow, this is super cool. And I went back to my hotel room that night and I took out an ad targeting married female, 34 year old employees of Likeable that lived in Port Washington, New York. Why? Of the billion plus people on Facebook, only one person saw that ad, my wife. And it was an ad targeting literally one out of a billion people. Now, what use is that? Well. It's fun if you want to target your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, but more important, the, 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 the idea is if you want to reach people, um, very, you know, if you want to reach just CEOs in your town or just CFOs in your state or just purchasing managers uh, in th within a three town radius, you can reach people very, very precisely based on geography, based on job title, based on uh, gender, based on marital status. So if I want to get to the CEOs in Westchester, yep. I could say, you know, 
female CEOs in Westchester that are over 40 years old. That's right. That's right. And 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 if you think about it right in the past, you could never you could never have that sort of precision with with advertising. You know, you you put yourself out there on TV or radio or newspapers and it would reach some of the right people, but it would reach a lot of the wrong people. If it's reaching the wrong people, by definition there's some waste there. No the question. Th- the thing about social media is, you know, yes, you have to pay now pretty much, but um, you know, for your for whatever X dollars you spend, you can know with 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 great accuracy that you're reaching exactly the right people. How often should you post on LinkedIn? Let's talk about LinkedIn and let's talk about targeting on LinkedIn. I, I, how do you target on LinkedIn and how often should you post on LinkedIn? Uh, you can post a lot on LinkedIn. Like the other social networks, it's gotten very crowded, which means that, you know, you, you can post once a day at least uh, on, on, on LinkedIn. Do you suggest um, it? Yeah, Once a day? Uh, um, I mean, it depends on your, yeah, I would say if you have, here's the thing about how often you should post, because that's one of the biggest questions I get. How often should you post on every social network? And the answer is kind of funny. The answer is um, all the time if you have great content to share and not at all if you don't have great content to share. That's so, fair. So, so, so the reality is if, if your content's going to resonate, post, go ahead. If your content, if you're not sure about that content, what I always like to say is take off your, uh, uh, marketing cap, put on your consumer cap and ask yourself before you click that post button, if I saw this in my feed, would I wanna share this with all of my friends? If the answer is yes, then it's probably worth posting. If the answer is no, I find it gimmicky, I find it sticky, I find it salesy, then probably not worth posting in the first place. That's a and great it, point. And thank you. And it's really it that, that that's that's simple. It, it's really simple. And and so with LinkedIn it's the same thing. Um, LinkedIn has grown a lot. It's probably my favorite social network right now. Mine too. Um, and you know what I love about LinkedIn is um, people are there for business, people are there for professionals, so there's much much less spam and people and time wasters I find. And if you can and you can also find people, you know, you can connect with just how? about anyone. How, how do you target on LinkedIn? And what's your best, what's your idea uh, on targeting on LinkedIn? Well, from advertising. advertising seems hard and very expensive. Well, advertising is definitely very expensive on LinkedIn. But again, you're reaching the right people. So would you pay 100 bucks to reach a Fortune 100 C- CEO? Yeah, I would. Of course, I'd pay 100 bucks for that. Um, and, 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 and even if you're not advertising, you can search. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I haven't told you. You can my- search if you have the premium. Uh, yes, that's right. right. Which so is reckon, worth it. Twenty bucks. Yeah, you got to get thirty bucks a month. Yeah, if you're on LinkedIn, you don't have the premium. Then you're not in it to win it. You don't. Do you know my wedding story? No. Let me tell you my wedding story because that'll set up my recent LinkedIn story. By the cool? way, real, real quick, if you have a question for Dave, we're going to do yeah. a little Q and A. All right. Got some stuff going on with your own social media questions. We're going to rifle through some questions in a few minutes. Just participate. Put your comments below. Also, love hearing where you're from as well. So if you're outside New York City. And by the way, if you're a meth fan and optimistic, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know. I'm actually going to post it on LinkedIn. You got to be both, by the way, optimistic and a meth fan, which is almost a, is that an oxymoron? Or no, no? Uh, we're, we're psyched, man. We're, we're tied for first right now. Love we, the new we are, GM. We are tied I'm for first. I'm on the new GM. We need, we need every New York sports team to do better. We love the rivalry, Met Yankees. Let's get the Knicks Nets going. Ranger Devils again, or Ranger Islanders would be amazing. I mean, how bad has New York sports been? It's been bad. Ooh, we're, we're, wow. we're, we're, we're in a bad wow, wow, we're, in, wow. we're in a bad zone. Your wedding story. Okay, wedding story, and then my LinkedIn, my recent LinkedIn story. So, um, so, so this was another sort of, I guess, movement. I guess we, we, we when we, uh, when I got engaged to my wife, we did not have enough money to afford a traditional large New York wedding. However, I wanted a large wedding. I wanted you to did be able your to wife reach. Did. Um, I did. I'm sorry. That's it was cool. me. Yeah, yeah I'm fair. sort of like I like to, I like to be able to. Uh, my wife likes to tell the story that I literally wanted to be able to say to you know somebody like I just met you and hey I'd love to have you at my wedding right and because that's I just I, I I like to be inclusive right I, I like to you know have I may have got the invite you, you would have gotten the invite the so what here's what we did we we, we had a, a marketing and sales background we had both we we met working for Disney in sales so we both you know had some some relationships we called up the Brooklyn Cyclone the affiliate of my uh, favorite to New York Mets. Brooklyn. And we pitched uh, Steve Cohen, the GM, on uh, having a sponsored wedding. 
and he said this is a totally crazy idea but uh i think you guys can pull it off some something something tells me you guys can do it so we bought out the sponsorship inventory from the game and we got married at the end of a game we had a promotion called our field of dreams and we ended up we give uh uh bobbleheads to the first 2500 people that came bridegroom bobbleheads um 1-800 flowers sponsored our flowers smirnoff sponsored our alcohol david's bridal sponsored our bridesmaids gowns entomin sponsored our desserts we raised a hundred thousand dollars for an unbelievable wedding i got married in front of 500 friends and family and 5,000 strangers. My grandma was like literally teaching the Hebrew to random fans that were watching my wedding. I mean, for me as a baseball fan, uh, it was an absolute dream come true. Nine groomsmen, got nine the, bridesmaids. Got the Coney Island in the background, oh, Nathan's oh. hot dogs. It was unbelievable but it ended up being a super successful marketing event as well we you know we had every network you know every every tv network or blogs i mean it was very very successful for our sponsors as well and that's actually what led to the wedding our I, what led to the business our our our, our vendors our wedding vendors hopefully said, it didn't lead to the wedding but that's no no it led, yeah. hopefully well yeah. you know if people would make jokes <laughs> you know you could have a sponsored divorce but you know thankfully you know 12 years later we're still good, good. so so um but our vendor said this was great, what are you gonna do next? And we couldn't get married again, so we started our, our, our first business instead. Fast forward to literally last week. Um, as it turns out, we have had a Passover Seder every year that's grown every year, and I like to have a very big Seder. How big? Last year we had 80 people. Now a typical Passover Seder could be you know, 15 people, yeah. maybe 20. Yes, it's gotten bigger and bigger. So, uh, we ha I had kind of a tough conversation with my wife recently, and we said, you know, it's gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, the price tag has gotten really, uh, it's gotten very expensive, and we love hosting Passover. We love it. Where do you put 80 people? We, we were fortunate to have an, 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 a nice size home um, in Port Washington, Port Washington Poker Club, represent. We'll get and, to that in a minute. Yeah, and, and, and so, um, but but it was getting, it was getting a little expensive, um, and we were thinking about downsizing. I, I went to LinkedIn and I had an idea. And within 10 minutes, I had found the brand manager from Maxwell House, who makes the Beautiful. Haggadah. Think about what uh, Maxwell House, really? Maxwell House makes the Haggadah for years, decades. The Maxwell House has sponsored the Haggadahs, right? In the stores, they give away the free Haggadahs. So I reached out to Maxwell House, I said, how would you like to sponsor one of the world's largest seders? We'll live stream it. We'll do the whole nine yards. It's not a done deal yet, but I believe we, I'm, I'm going to have Maxwell House come in and sponsor my seder so that I can grow it. The point I, the reason I bring this up is how could that possibly have happened 15 years ago? It would have been super, super hard. But, la but to this, today, I literally did a search on LinkedIn for Maxwell House, Vice President, Marketing, and within 10 minutes, I had found people, and then I reached out. Now... Not Manashevich, didn't go Manashevich. If Maxwell or... House said no, I would have gone Manashevich. Oh, okay. Correct. So that was nice but Maxwell thing. House makes the Haggadah, so I thought it was perfect. Uh, yeah. It was a perfect and people, fit. A lot of people don't know that or also know that they can go to get those. That's cool. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And we'll make some great coffee for dessert. And, and, and then you created all, a movement around the Met thing. Uh, how'd that do? Right. So last year, I was the CEO of a, of a mental health marketplace called UMA. And uh, the idea was to connect uh, clients to therapists, therapists to clients. And we had this idea. Uh, in order to create some publicity and also, frankly, offer people uh, that really needed help, some help. And so uh, I, we had the idea to give away free therapy for Mets fans, but I sat on it for a couple of weeks. I said, you know what? I'm gonna wait until a particularly embarrassing, humiliating moment for Mets fans, and then I'm gonna launch this. Uh, this uh, and what uh, moment was And that? I didn't have to wait long because literally less than two weeks later, Brandon, uh, in Washington, we lost, I think, like something like 22 to 4, yeah, 22 to 5. That. Yeah, that was crazy. And so the next morning, we launched the free therapy for Mets fans promotion. And what kind of activity? We got 120 million views. The site crashed from all the traffic. Um, and most important, we actually introduced free therapy to a lot of people. So people that otherwise, were maybe some guys that you know weren't comfortable going to therapy, actually took us up on the offer and, and went to therapy. Maybe some for the first time ever. So is the idea, if you're trying to launch a product which you know, you're grinding and you're trying to put one plus one together is it about coming up with that one idea that maybe uh, can get a lot of attention but also is somewhat connected to what you're doing it has to be connected to what you're doing and it has to be authentic and it has to be a great story I, again you know so often we think about our product but we don't think about what our product can do for others and how our product makes people feel uh, another another example I'm at a conference a word-of-mouth marketing conference 
That's and, an actual conference? Uh, yes, an actual word of mouth marketing word of mouth marketing association really Does that exists. still exist? It, it, it still exists. Drew, you got to find out where that is. I want to go speak at that. Nice. Man. Yeah, I mean, nice. I got to go speak at that conference. That's what I'm talking about. Because word of mouth, that's another old school thing it's that old people school. don't realize how important it is. Now, I realize kind of word of mouth in the modern day age is, is sharing. social media. It's yeah, sharing, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I'm at a word of mouth marketing conference, and uh, uh, we're talking about storytelling and the power of making things you know, go viral and get shared. Somebody raises their hand and say, what if you work for a super boring company? What do you do? What if you, what do you do if your product is super boring? She goes, for example, I have, I, I'm, I'm the director of marketing for a storage company. Storage is boring, she says. So I'm, I sit there, I raise my hand. I said, actually, I beg to differ. I said, you know, uh, storage saved my marriage. <laughs> and storage, I love storage because storage saved my marriage. I keep everything in the world. My wife wants to throw everything out. Same. So if so, if it weren't for storage, my baseball card collection, my memorabilia, my old magazines, I don't know where I'd be right now. It's not about the product. It's about how it makes people feel and how it connects people and the stories that you can tell. Well, she was moved. They actually ended up hiring which, us. Which, by the way, that's <laughs> the whole merit of Steiner Sports. Exactly. It's really not about how much that baseball is worth or whatever. It's how it makes you feel every it's time about, you look at it. It's about the memories. Which is what makes the, the, the collectible things so You cool. went to your first baseball game with your dad, and you, you, you got that baseball. You know, you watched that player, and then you ended up with something from that player. Of course. It's Are not a about the product. It's about how it makes you feel. I am. Again, it's how all about the Mets. How crazy collector are you? But you seem obsessed about everything else. But I mean, I have, I, I, I have more than one. Uh, signed uh, uh, Buckner, uh, Mookie Wilson, uh, uh, a poster. I, let's just say I have more than one. Okay. So I, I got some. I got some Met stuff, uh, some '86 stuff, stuff in my in my man cave. Uh, my wife got the dream house recently, but I got the dream man cave. That was the that was the well, that fair. was the negotiation. But you can't be deal. spilling over though. That's part of the deal, I imagine. Don't spill the man over. cave stuff can't go upstairs. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has I got to that, stay in the basement. I got that same that's deal. fair, that's right? Fair, yeah. It's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually one of, one of our sponsors. Um, from our wedding was a company called Dream Seat that makes the uh, yeah, yeah. beautiful chairs, yeah, and so they gave seat. us a Mets a, a Mets Dream Seat too. For, I for, think for the Mets were like the first to go put that out in the outfield too. That was yes, Paul they were. Yeah. They did that. Let me ask you going back to LinkedIn for a minute, sure. or just in general, because people are out there again trying to get the word out. So how it makes you feel? Don't worry about the product so much from your perspective, but worry about it from a customer's perspective. Totally, how it makes you feel. But again, if I did come up with that idea and I did have a compelling story, is it a a pay to play or is there certain ways to word uh, an yeah, article yeah or? great question so actually you know i wrote an article for inc after the uh, uma free therapy for mets france promotion that literally walked through the steps and the idea is okay so you've got this great story now let's how do we tell it first let's put it out there organically then let's find the influencers that are going to help to share your story for you for free how do you find them uh, I mean, you look, you search. You, you know, it's amazing how ultimate Met fan, for cer- example. Yeah, or, search, or search, exactly. People search, that have the Mets in their name. Search or- Mets fan on Twitter. Search Mets fan on Facebook. Search Mets fan on Instagram. You'll find a lot of stuff. Search the hashtags. It's actually, it's not that hard. Um, no, of course you could hire an agency if you have big bucks. But if you don't have big bucks, do the search yourself. Find the people. Offer them the story. Offer them something exclusive about the story. Or make them feel special in asking them to share the story for you. That's brilliant. Do Smart. the same thing for traditional media. Now, here's the. Uh, I'm going to say something that might not be the nicest thing in the world about media. He's fitting right in, isn't he? There's, I mean, right now, I mean, you you belong on this program. Nah, there, I'm just there, kidding. There, there's a lot of yeah. wonderful, wonderful people out there. However, most people in life, not just media, most people in life, are either busy, or lazy, or both. Okay, I've had times where I'm both. I'm definitely always busy. I've had some times where I'm lazy. What does that mean? That means that when we want somebody, to, somebody to do something for us, we have to make it super, super easy. So don't write to a, a, a member of the media and say, "Hey, I'd love to pitch you with a, a pitch you on something." Send them the story. Send them here's an, here's an idea, and and like literally frame the story for them. Make it as easy as possible so they can say, "Yep, I like that story. Let's run it." Make things super simple. Uh, and again, you can find media contacts on Twitter, on LinkedIn. It's it's not that hard anymore. So do that with your influencers. I would say if, it's not e- if it's not easy, it's not possible. That's right. That's kind of my mantra to that because I think people need easy, That's need right. simple. They need easy. Yeah. Um, and then and then and then when it comes to paying, um, 
it, 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 it is valuable to, to, to pay, but think about how you're, you're, you're going to pay and who you're gonna target. For instance, with that free therapy for Mets fans promotion, I did a $300 buy. $300 I spent on it. You know who I targeted? No, who? I targeted reporters, because I wanted them to write about the story. And once they wrote about the story, I knew it would catch on. So on LinkedIn, you just you did a search for reporters. I did a search on uh, on Facebook for reporters and producers, and that's who I. Drew, are you paying attention to this here? My man, Drew. I mean, hello. By the way, we have any questions for we? We're, we're going to jump into some questions. Q, right? I love Q and A. Yeah, let's do a little Q and A. I have really no idea what we're going to get into today. <laughs> but by the way, we'll ask you about the poker. Let's do a couple of questions and we'll talk about, but we'll keep you in suspense about this poker situation. Because I know somehow you have some kind of scheme or dream about <laughs> how poker works. Yeah. Question from Matthew. How hard was it to get companies to sponsor your wedding? Um, so, so, so it was, thanks, Matthew. It, it, it was, it wasn't actually that hard. The first one was the hardest. The first is always the hardest. Um, but what I was had, the first, the the first was 1-800-Flowers.com. Oh. That's cool. And I did have a relationship. We had done some, so, uh, some, some work for them through Disney. So we pitched. Uh, we, we we sort of floated the idea by them. We pitched it to them. Um, they they ran it up the flagpole pretty quickly. And Jim McCann, a wonderful wonderful mentor to me, um, the founder, co-founder, and, yeah. and chairman of 100flowers.com. It, it got his attention, and he and I had a conversation, and you know I I, I really just created the business case. I said for six thousand dollars worth of flowers. We're gonna get you a lot, a lot of eyeballs. The thing is, and by the way, I've gotten maybe four dozen requests over the years from people that want their wedding sponsored. But if you want your wedding sponsored and you're, you're gonna have a regular ordinary wedding with a couple hundred guests, why, why would yeah, why would anyone sponsor it? It's the there, value yeah. proposition. Yeah. So so if I have a value prop that's, I can guarantee you're gonna reach 8,000 people in a stadium. I can guarantee you that you're going to have a call to action that you can have print in their program. And I can't guarantee you're gonna get press, but I can say it is likely you're gonna get a lot of press out of this. That's a value proposition that works for a 1-800-Flowers.com. So once they bought into the value prop, they signed on. And then frankly, it got a lot easier very quickly. It got to the point where after the New York Times wrote about us, we were getting solicited by people. Bright Spot Smile called me up and said, hey, we'd love to white sponsor your teeth. Can we whiten your teeth for you? I said, oh, okay. I can That's use funny. that. Um, That's funny. Yeah, so, so, so it was actually, um, you know, it wasn't all that hard. But the hard thing is, in the beginning, coming up with a value prop that makes it worthwhile. Talk to me about poker. So I've I've gotten into poker uh, uh, the Why? last year or so. I think it's a great game. I think it's um it's a game that involves a lot of psychology. Um, in my book, The Art of People. If you do a quick book plug, The Art of People: Eleven Simple People Skills That Will Get You Everything You Want. I talk a lot about communications and how to how to get what you want by building relationships with people and I, what I love about poker is it's an opportunity to use communications and psychology to you know actually sort of monetize make money even when you don't have the better hand right in in in, in life sometimes you're going to have the better hand and sometimes you're not and winning when you don't have the better hand to me is a super uh, compelling and interesting um, an interesting uh, uh, challenge. And how do you deal with that interesting challenge? There's a lot of people out there that don't have the winning hand. Yeah, what's well, your, what's the dynamic? You, 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 you got to get creative. You have to get. You have to cer for, certainly um, think positively. I mean, optimism. I, I cannot tell you how many times optimism has been contagious and has created a winning scenario for me and and yet there's so many people out there that struggle with being optimistic they just you know they, they, they get down on their luck they don't have some successes and one thing builds upon another and I can tell you one I can tell you I promise you that optimism is contagious and so is pessimism and when you people want to hang out with somebody uh, uh, one of my favorite tips in this book it's 50 52 books ask me how I'm doing how you doing I'm fantastic when most people say how you doing, what do they say? Not bad. Not bad. Okay, fine. Now the new one is busy because everyone's busy. Do you want to hang out with someone that's not bad, or do you want to hang out with somebody that's fantastic? And when we can, you have to be authentically fantastic. Way, your attitude will determine your altitude. A hundred percent. That's kind of the mantra of it all. And it's amazing how just a small slip of one word 
could change the dynamic of a meeting or a conversation, right? Exactly, and, 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 and it's that optimism and that contagiousness that helps you influence others. Now, can I, I look, just because you're fantastic doesn't mean you're gonna win every hand in poker, but the idea is to be optimistic, um, to be confident, these things do make a difference in poker and in life. How often are you play in poker? So I play every every week with uh, with the Port Washington Poker Club. We're going to send one person to the World Series of Poker, and uh, you know we'll see who that is. But um, we're 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 gonna we're gonna make that happen later this year. And uh, I, but is the, know, ma- is the mantra uh, the, the the switch of words here and the play on words? Are you kind of playing poker every day in your life, though, in some sense? Of, of, yeah, of, of yeah, it, yeah, kinda, for sure, right? for sure, for sure. Sometimes you um, got the hand, sometimes you don't. But, so, but but you but you but you always have to play. Some Smart. That's right. That's yeah. right. But, uh, Drew, what else we got? A uh, question here from John. Tell us about. By the way, you gotta your... have the camera on you. People can't see you. Yeah, why is Drew? Drew yeah, us on camera. Why are you in the dark? He's the man there. that makes it all happen. Jeez. Tell us about one of your craziest publicity stunts during your time in Boston, and how were you able to make it work? Um. Well, I talked about the um, the the the, the crunch and munch guy. I mean, that was that was, was the amazing. craziest. Um, but I'll tell you a funny one. One of my funnier stories about 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 that um it was at fenway park and you know i was i was definitely popular with the fans but i was unpopular with certain folks including some of the staff i had a um i had an incident where a woman was throwing a woman was throwing me money it was actually a fan from kansas city she was throwing me money and a guy got hit in the head with a quarter (laughs) now i don't think he was hurt at all but a, secu- hope not. but a security guard who, let's say, he wasn't a fan of mine, okay? He saw the incident. He wrote up the incident. An incident report went to the, the powers that be. And before I knew it, I'm not even kidding, I was fired for, quote, inciting violence that could have ended up in injury. Now, you know, in all seriousness, obviously, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but... This was a little bit of a stretch, more than a little bit of a stretch. So, obviously, I had to, I had to, you know, follow the rules. I, I left. I was fired, but uh, I took it up. Uh, I went to, we actually went to arbitration. I've never gone, you know, like ath- like real athletes go to arbitration. You know, uh, as a ballpark vendor, I guess you know they have a they have a a, a path Hearing. to go to arbitration. Exactly. I went to arbitration. Um, I won my job back, and then storytelling wise, I took the story uh, and made it easy, told that story for a friend at the Boston Herald. And it must have been a very slow news day that day, Brandon, because I I knew I was going to be in the paper, right? So I I remember staying up late with a buddy of mine in college. And um, I don't know, the early edition came out at, I don't know, 2 a.m. or whatever. This was back when newspapers were a big thing. (laughs) I'm showing my age, right? But um, we stayed up. And it must have been a super slow news day because I show up to buy the uh, to go to Stop and Shop to get the newspaper, and there I am on the front page of the Boston Herald. <laughs> and the title being, you know, you used to say that in a quarter get your phone call, <laughs> that in a quarter get your fired, yeah, get you fired. It, 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 the headline was, "He's back." Ball, a popular ballpark vendor wins job back in arbitration to return to Fenway Park today. <laughs> it was just hysterical. You know, I, need, I need a copy. I'm, re- I'm reposting that story. There's some Will good memorabilia. Yeah, I'm yeah, telling you. You, it, you got that story. Uh, of course. Oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to send it to you. So it, it's about, you know, look, you have, to, you have to have the story to tell. But once you have that story to tell, um, helping to get it into the right hands makes a very big difference. And back then, it was traditional media. Today, the great news is it could be traditional, but it could also be social. It could be influencers. It yeah. could be people with a lot of followers. I, I, I'm going to make and an also offer. Mix, and also, t- don't be afraid to target other media people if you think you have a story worth somebody else really writing about. I'm going to make an offer right now to anyone watching live. Send me on LinkedIn a great story that you have to tell, and I will share it with my 675,000 followers. That's how many people you're sharing on LinkedIn? Anyone watching right now. Drew, now we, we, we gotta send them our best story. Now, yeah, don't spam me with like, uh, yeah. I'm looking to sell more get more, more widgets. That's not, that's not gonna fly. But if you have a good story to tell, Send it to me on LinkedIn. I'm I will put it out my to my best followers. Story too, you, I think awesome. you got a couple stories. That's you got awesome. a couple stories. That, that's awesome. But I, let's go back to that for a minute because you know, I have 37,000 people on LinkedIn. And I got to tell you, how do you get past that? Because it seems very difficult. Did you, did you do that early on? 
Yeah. So first move. Is that possible is to big. still do that? Or? I think it's still possible, but it's a lot harder. But okay. so the, the lesson, the quick lesson there is first mover advantage is really, really big. If you are one of the first on a social platform, you can be an early influencer, get the big following quickly. Um, I missed the boat with Twitter. I missed, uh, I pretty much missed the boat with Facebook, but I jumped on early enough with LinkedIn to build a, you know, a very, very, you know, one of the top followers so in the world. One, that's one of your biggest trends, I assume. That. Absolutely. Yeah, so, it's big. so, so the takeaway is this: if you want to be on the cutting edge, you know, it's risky to be early because it might be a flop. But on the other hand, if you're early on the next, you know, on TikTok, uh, you know, TikTok is really big with kids. It's not so big with adults. If you believe that TikTok is going to be the next big thing with adults, get on there now uh, and start building a following. And then you'll be one of the, you know, you'll have one of the bigger followings if it, if it hits. So again, it's taking a chance, but it might be worthwhile. So yeah, I was early on in LinkedIn. And, um, you know, if, I, if I'm going to give some advice right now, um, uh, it's 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 you you're doing a nice job by by inviting me on your show because I'm I just promoted my your show on my LinkedIn. Um, oh, thank so you. connect with people that have more followers than you and have them and work and promote them. Right. So people think about promoting themselves, but instead of promoting yourself or in addition to promoting yourself, promote others, promote others that have more followers than you. They're gonna notice. When people always I, comment I, I, on my I, blog post, I notice who's, I, I notice. I, I say more, think more not what value you can get, but think first and foremost what value you can give. That's because right. Because most people look at, when they see a big situation, 675,000, wow, what can I get from him? I'm thinking in my mind, what can I give him? What value can I provide to you that would be interesting for you? you and and that's the name of the game. No? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just gonna. I, it's it. I definitely. I think that I, I have think a people misunderstand on that because when they see somebody wealthy, they think about all the money they can get from that person, as opposed to thinking about what value you can provide that yeah. person. I have a chapter on that: how to meet just about anyone, and the the, the answer is to offer value for them. And uh, I became friends with Barbara Corcoran because I helped her become, build a following on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, How is Barbara, by the way? She's fantastic. Great to work she's, with. She's fantastic. She w seems like the real deal. She's a pip. She's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. She, 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 she. I, I pitched her on a business. She didn't end up investing in us, but what well, was hysterical? I brought my CTO in there. You know, he's a grown, he's a, he's a grown man, great guy, and uh, she just walks right up to him and goes, "You got such great cheeks." And she mentions, and she can get away with that. You know what I mean? She, she's got that. This is just the real she's deal. Got she's got that style. She's got to be a Brooklyn. She can get she's away from with Brooklyn. that. Uh, she seems she like should it. be from the borough. Ten percent of the world. Is yeah. from or lived in Brooklyn? Am I right? There's no question. Do you agree with that out there? I agree with that. So, so I go in and I I go in and I speak a lot. And one group I speak to is college students. And I'm talking to college students about how you can, how to, how to get people's attention by offering them value. And 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 occasionally I'll have students say, Well, what do I have to offer? What how what could I possibly offer some big successful person? And I say, I I tell you what. You could call up any Fortune 500 CEO right now, or the equivalent of calling them, look, you know, look them up and reach out on LinkedIn, and say, I'd like to offer you a 15-minute free tutorial on how to use Snapchat. Snapchat represents a huge, you know, it's in the third edition of social of, of likable social media because it didn't exist eight years ago. Snapchat represents a whole new twist on how people communicate, and I can guarantee you, there's probably not a single Fortune 500 CEO out there that has a clue about how to use Snapchat. So if you're a young person, if you're 20, 19, 21 years old, you could probably add a lot of value to a Fortune 500 CEO's life by teaching them how to use Snapchat, as an example. Guilty as charged. Uh, what else would you tell a college student while you're, while you're on a roll? What, what's something else you tell a college student that they should know uh, what kind of value they I, can I, provide? I, you know, look, I'm, I'm careful about giving advice, but if I could go back, I'd like to do this. If I could go back, what would I do? If I could go back... I would absolutely read more and I would write more. You know, I started writing, I've written four books now and lots of blog posts, lots of articles, but reading and writing actually makes you smarter. It's unbelievable. And you know, early on, I just, I didn't realize that. I wish I had journaled, I wish I had written more um, on a more consistent basis. I wish I had watched less TV, especially uh, TV news. TV news is like, it's just so sensationalistic and, and negative and cynical. I, I I, I wish I had done a little bit less of that and a little bit more reading and writing. A couple more things you wish you didn't do? 
Uh, <laughs> well, you know, like many college students, I, 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 uh, I, I, I partied a little bit here and there, so I uh, probably would do a little bit less of that. Oh, and I would definitely take more risks, uh, especially in my social life. I was real nervous, really shy, uh, you know, was terrified to you ask had, a girl you, out You on wish a date. you asked her out. I wish I asked her out. If yeah. not you, then who? Yeah. I always said, like, if not me, then who? But then, yeah, there was some beautiful dark-skinned, six-foot-four stud who was the answer to my question, but still, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you women, never know. Well, women have to, I mean, you can't. You can't anticipate, just like in business, what women or what business people are going to say. Here's or what the they're thing. feeling or thinking. Here's the thing. If you don't ask, then it's definitely a no. 100%. The only way to possibly get a yes is to ask. And I didn't figure that out until later. And eventually, fortunately for me, I, I ended up marrying up about four or five levels. My wife is, you know, the most, you know, she's, she's, she's certainly way more attractive, way smarter, way more talented. But... Thankfully, I learned that lesson in time, and I wish I had learned it a little bit earlier. I probably would have had a lot more fun if I had taken some more chances and, 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 and asked some more questions. I always say the most important thing is you got to partner up. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, intelligence and, and what somebody can, can offer to help the roof over your head become bigger is huge. And I, I think some people get caught up with money or looks and things, but when you want to partner, even in business, you want to partner up. Somebody who's got even a bigger brand who can offer you more services so you can even grow yours even bigger. And then it goes on and on because that P word is the one thing that can take you down. You know, when things are not right in your marriage or if you have a partner that you're unhappy with, it just, it's drudge. It, it's the worst thing in the world. You're, yeah. you're misery. Yeah. Because, you know, you're with that person through thick and thin yeah. all day, all night. Yeah. And the breakup is, huh. even in business, the business breakup with your partner is it's impossible. You're, you're married uh, how, how 30, long? 30, 30 years. years, yeah. God bless. I'm married up. Yeah. Oh good, yeah. Yeah. Good. I married. I need an elevator to get up to. to, <laughs> to but you know, I, you know. Listen. All you need to do, you know, even every dog even gets has a every lucky dog day. Has day. So that's why I'm a Mets fan. Getting back you know, to that, you know, because uh, one have day, day. You'll have one your day, day, it's going to be so sweet when we finally win. You'll have your day. I will say, you know, a, a, a lot of entrepreneurs. Getting back to entrepreneurs, yeah. I know entrepreneurs watch your show. Yeah. And um, I I talk about the value of partnership because. It's, it's the hardest thing to do in the world, being an entrepreneur. It's the loneliest thing to do in the world. And having an amazing partner that you implicitly trust and love you know, and enjoy. It, 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 and enjoy. It doesn't have to be your wife. I mean, I, I'm I'm fortunate because I my wife is my business partner. We literally go through everything to, everything together. But having somebody that you can absolutely trust and share with is super super valuable. And if you whether you have that or not, the other thing that I strongly recommend to to entrepreneurs is a peer group. You know, an EO, a YPO, um, a Vistage, a YEC. Joining an organization that gives you that that peer group that you can that you can talk to that you can. We're all you know, unique. But our circumstances and situations are very similar to we're all going through the same stuff, regardless right. of your financial. We've all either been through it, going through it. That's right. And, you know, you, the more you can share, and, and most people just have a hard time sharing the That's truth. That's right. That's right. But if you could share the truth, especially with people that have already gone through what you've gone through, it doesn't mean you have to listen to all of it, but you get a better perspective. One of, my, fa one of my favorite quotes, um, it's in neither of these books. I, 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 wrote, I wrote a book that, uh, that no one's bought. It's the, it's the best reviewed book I've I've. I've, uh, I've, I've I've written and it's the worst selling book. Why? Because that is a really bad cover and everyone in fact does and judge a book by its cover, which I learned a little too late. Anyway, in that book is one of my favorite quotes from Oprah Winfrey. If I had known that being vulnerable would make me this rich, I would have done it a lot sooner. The idea is we're all, to your point, many of us are walking around scared to be vulnerable, to be authentic, to let out the real us. But when we actually do it, like magic happens. It's when we admit that we're scared and we don't know what's going on and we're struggling that people want to want want to help us. That, that that people really appreciate that vulnerability and that being real and and they respond to it. And it, it it's, it's ironic because we're so scared of letting down that 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 guard and letting down that mask. But when we actually do, it, good things almost people always see that, happen. People see that as a sign of, of weakness. You know, Brene, Brown, Brene uh, Brown talks a lot about vulnerability, but at the end of the day, yeah. it's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength. I, I think so. I have a chapter in here, Crying is for Winners, which, you know, I uh, mean, especially a lot of men that don't necessarily uh, uh, feel that way. Uh, you know, when kids grow up, uh, especially boys, you know, if kids are crying, what's the first thing that an adult says to them? Don't, don't cry. cry. 
Well, why not? Like, let the kid cry. For, he's not feeling good. Let the kid cry and you'll, you'll, you'll work it out. It's okay to cry, actually, you know? So uh, I, I think cool. that we teach it from a very, very young age not to be vulnerable, but... Uh, we got time for one or two more questions, man. I could talk to you all day. We're going man. all we're going yeah. a long time. We'll be going longer, but you, I expect nothing less. I mean, really, a Brooklyn guy. There come was on. no, there was come not. On. There's been nothing short of anything you've ever done, right? <laughs> Is that true? What you've always short? gone a long way. You've yeah, I go. Not, yeah, yeah, we go long. Yeah, we go why long. Not? I mean, I find this fascinating, and what I, I mean, hopefully, people are staying with it to watch. But we'll repurpose three quarters of this. Okay, good. Because there's like ten different nuggets. We'll here tie it up. Yeah, we we'll, can't we'll, let our we'll audience miss. It. Actually, one yeah. of my things about content is take don't people people think that um, they, they 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 don't want to bore people, so they don't put out the same content twice. On the contrary, you can put content out many many times. Funny story. Quora is a question and answer site. And one of my favorite questions on Quora is, um, "What's your favorite experiment?" And the guy goes this. Uh, you know how people on their on, on have their birthdays on Facebook? Yeah. So he goes this. I did an experiment where every day on Facebook I changed my birthday to the current day until nobody wished me a happy birthday. In other words, he wanted to see how many people were paying attention. And guess what? He went over a year, 400 days, where every single day people were still wishing him a happy birthday. Why? Because on any given day, most people aren't freaking paying attention. So what does that mean for your content? That means that don't take this great content and put it out once and forget about it. If you have great content, put it out once, then twice, then three times, then five times, Ch change it up a little bit and put it out a sixth time. Or find the best part of the content and lead with that. Yeah, that's right, lead with different things, test it out, see what works. You know, we, we have this thing where like, we're like we, we do all this work for content and then we put it out once and you know five people see it and then we're like okay let me move on to creating some new content that's crazy that's ridiculous so yes by all means please mix it up Ch share it a few times i'm sure that a new person will pay Love attention that. that wasn't paying attention last Couple time questions by the way i'm officially inviting you to go to the yankee met game with me we have nice to thank you yeah, i'm in uh, at yankee stadium oh by the way. i knew you were gonna say that well it's okay but i will wear at my i will wear my mets hat I will wear my Mets hats. No, you're cool wearing a Mets hat. I mean, I can't be responsible for what's going to happen. But but Yankee fans are cool. Mets fans can get a we're little not. crazy. We're, we're the bitter ones. Right. It's embarrassing, but, but we're but, the bitter ones. But the beer is good at, at, at City. The beer is good. Leg you know what? Legends is the second best uh, seat and food I've had in any anywhere in the country. You know where's number one? The new SunTrust in Atlanta. Unbelievable. I haven't been to the new stadium in Atlanta. I've been to every ballpark in the country. I've been to every ball. How many how many stadiums have you been to total? All of them. And I've how been to many ones. I've uh, been to 46. On the baseball, probably about 35, 40. 16 that yeah. are no longer, 46 yeah. total. I've probably been to about 35, 40, but I've been to so many football Favorite stadiums. Favorite stadium besides Yankee, you can't say Yankee. Um, I know it's gonna be random, but I'm gonna say Arizona. Okay, that's a because good one. the flexibility of the roof yep. and the different levels of how you can sit. Yeah. Because there's so many variations of how you can sit and the food was very, very wide. But also Pittsburgh was awesome. You're too. gonna hate. I like Pittsburgh. I like uh, Arizona. Pierogies, I like, baby. I like uh, uh, San Francisco. And you're gonna hate this, but you know what my favorite stadium Fenway. is? It's Fenway. Yeah, Fenway is amazing. It's I'm, uh, I would be right it's, there with it's it. It's stunning. You know, yeah. there's and nothing. No, I mean, you can never be bored going to Fenway. And number the two people, is Wrigley. And number two is Wrigley because you yeah. know what? For all these amazing, you know, new stadiums, there's something about the true classics. I like yeah. the old Yankee Stadium better. By oh, the way, oh yeah, I love the old Yankee yeah. Stadium. Love the new one. Wrigley just. Eh. That's not for Tell you. Tell me your favorite stadium for out there. Or yeah, favorite football. stadium also favorite football too that's my next thing trying to get to all these football and basketball college arenas yeah is a big deal but i was really shocked how close you were in, P in pittsburgh to home plate when you sit behind the plate pittsburgh's like, a good like, one no space there yeah by the way the new marlins park didn't like it but the food the food, food was, good. was amazing in the new I, one i don't remember it being they had too this memorable. whole little area where they had local purveyors yeah and that was the shit. But you would have loved, you know, cool. I, I've been to every stadium, and my, my buddies and I from high school, we have a whole rating, a set of criteria. We rate the food, we rate the, the promotions, we rate the hot dogs, we rate yeah. the pricing. Same, my son and I, we've been through it all. We rate, the, I'm embarrassed about this one as a grown adult, but we rate the security because what we used to do is, of course, sneak down of to course. the lowest seats. What was your favorite stadium overall, though? It's Fenway. I mean, after Fenway. Oh, uh, probably AT&T in San, San Francisco. Really? Yeah, yeah. I it's love a, that. It, it's a great one. It was pretty good, though. It's a great one. It was pretty good. I, mean, uh, 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 I got one, nice one, job. One, one, more, one more funny story about Fenway. So, so I told you I, I used to uh, I raced. I used to sneak down to the best seats possible at, at Shea Stadium, et cetera, in any stadium I was at when I was a kid. And occasionally security would come and kick us out, and you know we'd 
Find another you know, seat. We find another seat. But as I got older, it got slightly more embarrassing, and so I, st I stopped doing it as much, right? So fast forward to uh, one of my investors, an amazing guy, a guy by the name of Tom DiBenedetto. He's a partner in the Boston Red Sox. He invites me up to his suite. We're watching a game at, at Fenway. I'm in the owner's box, okay? He tells me to move up uh, because, you know, we're in like the second row, but he, there's, the first row is empty, so I move up to the first row. He goes to the bathroom. All of a sudden, I get scared that, you know, I'm not in this right seat. And then, literally, I hear, excuse me, sir, excuse me. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm in the owner's box, and he's gonna kick me out of my seat. I turn around, he goes, would you like another plate, sir? <laughs> I said, okay. It's okay. Time, times are better now. Times are better. Yeah. There's nothing like the owner's box seat, though, man. Special. Special. Or, you know, was, for me, my favorite seat of all time mm. was when I used to go to the old stadium, sit up in uh, Mr. Steinbrenner's box. Oh, nice. Because the level of intensity. Yeah. The food was good, yeah. and you got to sit at George's desk, yeah. which was cool always. Yeah. And I call everybody I could call. But the intensity how level. How did you? How did you meet? Uh, how I was at. Meet? I was at. You know. I was at the sporting club. I was a general manager, and the owner of the sporting club was a little bit part of the Yankees. You get two seats in the owner's box, and he would take me all the time. So I got to meet Mr. Steinbrenner many, many times, and the level of intensity, the amount of trades, or guys that he was going to get rid of by the ninth inning, <laughs> and you know, I just loved it. The passion was so real to me because you never know with some of these bigger than life characters. Yeah. But I knew I knew Mr. Steinbrenner was all business and all serious about it. And then he had this other side to him that was so fan centric, like you know World Series 1999. I'm sitting there, uh, and I'm flipping out a little bit because it's Game Six. Um, if you remember, uh, was it Game Six? And no, no, in in ninety, um, what was that? Ninety six. In ninety six was Game Six against Atlanta, and I had sold all my seats. I didn't have a seat, so I scalp a seat to go. And now I'm flipping out because my mind's going a million directions. And then sure enough, um, I see Mr. Steinbrenner yelling in the ninth inning. Here we are about to win the World Series about some trash <laughs> that was outside a dumpster. He was uh, he was uh, fervent. And he was, yeah. It, it meant so much to the experience to the fan. He, he was so interested in every aspect of winning. And I always tell people, like, don't chase the wins. Chase the things that get the wins. Yeah. And, and he, was, he was concerned about the parking. He was concerned about the vendors. He had his binocular. I mean, he just was an all-in owner. They don't make them like that anymore. Nah. Nah. But I, I, I feel blessed to just watch that because it's very impressionable to me to know that. Because I was always like, don't sweat the little things. I'm like, no, sweat the little things. Right. Like and he kind of emphasized that to me in his own way by watching him work. And even when you're in his suite, he sweated, sweated the little things. He always had that loyalty of the same person singing a national anthem and all the little traditional stuff. Yep. Which at the end, when it's all said and done, that's the stuff that gets you. Sure. Right. Totally. A couple quick questions. We're gonna go, man. We're going 60 minutes. This is long. This is okay. unbelievable. Can I set a record? What's your record? This is What's the your record? record? We 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 we, uh, yeah, we got the record here. A couple quick ones couple here. Quick questions. From, we'll let you go. Thanks for hanging in with us. From Matt, what was it like being on a reality show? How how much huh. was reality and how much was stage? Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Wow. Did you like that though? Did you so that? Uh, you know, it was a unique experience. Uh, I didn't tell this part of the story for you, but um, basically, I was at Disney. I was working for uh, I was working in sales for Disney, and uh, the uh, I was the number one salesperson in the country for Disney until this woman started working in my office. She dropped me to number two within three months. I fell madly in love with her. Wanted to marry her and and uh, hopefully one day go into business with her. But there was one slight problem. She was married already. She moved to New York with her husband. True story. This is a true story. She moved to New York with her husband. I did what anyone with unrequited love would do. I left Disney and went on a reality TV show to find true love. <laughs> yes, and as, 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 the, as the question asker asked, uh, it was called Paradise Hotel. It was a sleazy show on Fox. It was starring sexy singles at a luxury resort and me. Which made for some really interesting TV, you know, a schleppy uh, a Brooklyn uh, Jewish kid with all these uh, so hot, uh, sexy fearless. people. You're, 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 you're well, fearless. Well, you know, look, here's what I like to say. I'm not fearless, but I feel the fear and do it anyway. That's what courage is, right? It's, it's being afraid, but just jumping in anyway. So, so I, I jump on there. Um, my, my buddies, my, 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 all my buddies said, Dave, whatever you do, don't drink too much. <laughs> okay, so I arrive in Acapulco, $40 million house, 1,200 cameras on me. Two in my face and, you know, 1,200 hidden cameras everywhere possible. And it's literally all these good-looking people my first night there. So what do I do? 
I have 21 drinks, 21 yeah, long yeah, and that was a mistake. That was a huge mistake. And it was a mistake that was caught on camera for the rest of the world to see. So huge mistake. That was, but I recovered from that. I, I was on the, the show till the very end, you know, made it, uh, you know, uh, uh, 31 episodes. <laughs> and um, it was actually an amazing learning lesson. I, I write about it in The Art of People because um, here I was with people that were nothing like me, but I was challenged. We had no TV, radio, internet, phones, access to the outside world, nothing. My entire world for three months became these random people and I had to build relationships with them. So to the extent that it taught me how to relate to people, how to build bridges, how to find things in common with people, no matter what, it was totally, totally uh, valuable. That's cool. Last, last one question. here. Yeah, last one. It's from former Project X uh, appearance, uh, Brian Eisenberg. Let's have the Brooklyn pizza debate. What's your favorite? I, I know Brian, great marketer, by the way. Yes, uh, like so, Brian. So, so, so gotta, you gotta love Brooklyn guys from uh that that know what's how to do funny some about the whole pizza debate is you yeah. talk to people from the bronx and it gets very very intense about the pizza situation on author avenue and this and that no can't we all just live in peace and love can't, our like pizza? can't we all get along can't we all get along about our pizza and, and just kind of respect the fact that lb is the best i'm just, gonna, just, let, let, I'm just, gonna give a that. shout out to my yeah. boys in bay ridge pizza wagon seriously okay in bay ridge makes a damn good pizza better than lb I, I'm 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 gonna stake my reputation on it. I'm Is anybody stake, I'm, out there can tell up. me that they got better pizza than LB? Please pizza let wagon. Me know. Have you been to Pizza Wagon no. in Bay Ridge? No, I'm not gonna have to I want to say 88th Street. Yep. Really? Yep. Because I grew up in Sunset Park, the hood. There was no. It was not. There was not a lot of pizza there, to be honest. But we went to Bay Ridge for our pizza. We went to Park Slope for our synagogue, and uh, you know I got out alive. So so it's all good. It's tough to compete with El Vito when that comes right out. Oh man, very few, very few, few places can you eat three, four, or five slices and still want more. I love pizza very, very much. It's a big, big problem because, yeah, yeah. you know, as as it, as it turns out these days, you know, in my 40s, I'm trying to, like, be healthy yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Pizza doesn't and pizza, help. Pizza is, like, one of the least healthy things on the planet. Can somebody figure out how to make a healthy slice of pizza that actually tastes good? Well, you have the now, sour that would pizza. Be, you know, the sour pizza, which is not really pizza. pizza. It's not really pizza, you and know. it's not really good. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, so you know, we, we got a lot of great entrepreneurs watching this show. I'm going to put out a challenge right now to make a slice of pizza that that is healthy and tastes good you send it my way i will promote it for you for 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 years on on all my followers on every social network you, you just it. get me a we're great sending you healthy a, we're slice sending of pizza you our favorite story we gotta go we're we gotta over go an hour it's been we fun. went over an we hour we went over an hour i can't believe it thanks for staying with us